Gold has been traditionally used as a safe haven investment for a long time. If there is a crisis, investors pivot to the mineral. But is this place being threatened by Bitcoin? In this video, we will dive into the gold and Bitcoin world. We will discuss if Bitcoin is the new gold, the mystery behind the Bitcoin founder, and look into if it would be possible for the dollar to still be pegged to gold. In the end, there is also a bonus video about the most expensive cities in the world. Now, let's start with a video about how gold is moved around. This is Germany, the country of beers, fast cars, sausages and gold? Yes, the German government has the second biggest gold reserves in the world, behind the US only. Half of this is kept in the vaults of the Bundesbank, the German central bank, in Frankfurt. The other half is divided between New York and London. But it was not always like this. Until 2012, Germany had only 31% of its gold kept within its borders. Over a period of five years, in a secret operation, the country repatriated 674 tons, moving the gold from Paris and New York to Frankfurt. But how did this happen? Let's take a look. To understand why the Germans repatriated their gold, we need to go back in time. It was during the economic miracle of the 1950s and 1960s that Germany began stockpiling large amounts of the precious metal. West German companies became export powerhouses during this time and were being paid in dollars. The central bank used this flow of the American currency to purchase gold. Back then, under the so-called Bretton Woods system, all currencies had fixed exchange rates based on the dollar. And the dollar's value was tied to gold. Most of the German gold bought during this time was kept in New York, mainly due to security reasons. During the Cold War, Frankfurt was only about 100 kilometers from the border with Soviet-controlled East Germany. The threat of invasion was taken very seriously, and so keeping the gold abroad seemed to be the best option at the time. Fast forward to 2013, when the German Central Bank announced that it would repatriate 300 tons of gold from New York Federal Bank and all the 374 tons that were stored in Paris. The operation was expected to last until 2020. But by August 2017, the bank announced that the job was completed. The logistics of the operation were surrounded by secrets. Officially, very little information was shared, but based on previous experiences and specialists, this is probably how it worked. Let's start with the 300 tons from New York. They were located at the high-security vaults of the Federal Reserve Bank, which is the world's largest known depository of monetary gold. In 2019, the vault had approximately 497,000 gold bars, a total of 6,190 tons. It's possible to keep all of that in one place without causing the building to collapse, because the vault rests on a bedrock of Manhattan Island, 80 feet below street level. To access the vault and reach the 300 tons of gold bars, the German Bundesbank officials had to go through the standard security procedure. One can only enter the vaults with what the bank calls a control group, which is formed by two members of the Fed Gold Vault staff and one internal audit staff. The three people must be present every time something happens in the vaults. To access the compartments, there is only one entry, which is protected by a 90-ton 9-foot-tall steel cylinder that is set in a 140-ton steel and concrete frame. When the concrete frame is closed, it creates an airtight and watertight seal while its four steel rods are inserted into holes and time clocks are engaged, locking the vault until the next business day. After passing all these security obstacles, the control group and the German representatives have access to the compartment where the gold is stored. That's when the officials were able to inspect the bullions and separate the portion that would be transferred, preparing for the second phase, the actual trip. There are two options to transfer gold overseas, plane or ships. Sending gold on a ship would be much riskier and expensive, as it would take much more time. So in this case, planes were probably considered the best option. For safety reasons, normally it's an insurer's requirement that a maximum of one ton of gold can be moved per flight. The German repatriation plan looked like this. So, over a period of four years, a total 300 flights moved one ton of gold each. In New York, the Federal Bank building is about 20 miles away from the Lufthansa cargo area of JFK Airport. An armored truck would most likely have been used. Once at the airport, the gold would be classified as a safe TD-1 product by Lufthansa, which means it's very valuable for insurance purposes. From the armored truck to the plane another security protocol is followed before the gold is finally ready for takeoff to Frankfurt. The truck personnel does not see where the cargo they just delivered is being taken. Part of the gold that was in New York did not go straight to Frankfurt though. 
It was flown to Zurich, where the gold bullions were remodeled into bars that meet the London good delivery standards. This format has sloping edges and makes the bars easier to pick up than the New York bars, which are shaped like bricks, which are easier to store. From Zurich, the bars would be flown to Frankfurt, where officials checked its authenticity and purity as well as the weight. After this process, they were deposited in the gold vault of the Bundesbank. Mission completed. The 100 tons of gold from Paris traveled a similar path. Again, ground transport would pose risks that are minimized through air travel. From the Banque de France to the Lufthansa cargo area at the Charles de Gaulle airport is approximately 16 miles. This would also be done on armored trucks. From there, one single flight to Frankfurt, where the gold would travel to the Bundesbank vault and be stored. At the end of the operation, Germany repatriated 674 tons of its gold reserves. New York still holds more than a third of the total and London 432 tons. The repatriation cost the German government 6.9 million euros. But why would a country spend this much money on such a risky operation? According to German media, the decision to bring the gold back has nothing to do with economic factors, but one thing only, symbolism. Or as the Bundesbank puts it, to build trust and confidence domestically. And the Germans were not the only ones to repatriate gold in the last decade. The Netherlands undertook a similar move in 2014. In 2018, Hungary announced it would bring its three tons of gold from London. Poland also moved its reserves in 2019. At the same time, countries like China, Russia, Kazakhstan and Turkey also bought huge amounts of gold, mainly to avoid exposure to the dollar, but that's a different story. Many moves can also bring many problems. In 2018 for example, crisis hit Venezuela wanted to bring back its gold from London. But the Bank of London, where Venezuela had what is believed to be 31 tons of gold, simply refused to repatriate. The reason was that Nicolas Maduro wasn't recognized as the legitimate leader after his disputed 2018 re-election. Facing sanctions from Western countries, the Venezuelan government also had difficulties selling its gold, so much so that in 2019 there were reports that Maduro, in a movement to avoid the sanctions, and with the help of the Russians, flew 7.4 tons of gold, the equivalent of over $300 million at the time, to a refinery in Uganda, and afterward was sent to Abu Dhabi, where it is believed to have been sold. With this tactical move, the Venezuelan government avoided international sanctions and still probably profited from the operation. But aside from Venezuela, where the intention to repatriate gold is mainly to save an economy on the brink of collapse, what's the other country's motivation for these dangerous high-effort projects? Adam Blapinski, president of the National Bank of Poland, justified the action saying that gold symbolizes the strength of a country. Well, he is not wrong. In general, gold is seen as a safe haven investment. That's why often during or right after a period of crisis there is a gold rush in the world. The last time that happened was in 2020 when it became clear that the coronavirus pandemic would have long-lasting effects on economies. The fear that other traditionally profitable investments like stocks, bonds, or real estate might lose value pushed people to the precious metal. In August 2020, the ounce topped $2,000 for the first time. And as it happened with countries that repatriate, investors that pivot to gold also face logistical challenges. So what options are there for private investors to keep the shiny metal safe? Once an investor buys gold bullion, there are only three options to secure it, keep it at home, use a bank's safe deposit box or pay for a third-party storage firm. Usually, banks are the go-to solution. But the financial institutions normally do not insure contents of safe boxes, and buying separate insurance for precious metals is expensive and hard to get. Besides that, there is the fact that banks are accessible only during business hours. If the price skyrockets in a day and the investor wants to benefit from this it might be a challenge to access the gold quickly with a bank in between. Moreover, in the unlikely but still possible event of an economic meltdown, banks might close and the metals kept in safes would be trapped inside. Traumatic experiences from the past also play a role here. In 1933 American President Franklin D. Roosevelt blamed the slow recovery post-1929 crash on the hoarding of gold and signed an executive order forbidding it within the United States. Penalties were $10,000 fine or 10 years imprisonment, sometimes both. People were allowed to own only the equivalent of $100 in gold coins. Fear that history may repeat itself pushes gold owners to choose the option of private storage companies. Usually, they offer all kinds of extra services to safely store the precious metal. 
A storage firm in London offers chauffeur, Rolls-Royce, and security apparatus that includes fingerprint and iris scan. The safe boxes are steel-lined and supposedly impenetrable. Those services don't come cheap and an investor might actually have to spend a couple of the gold bars to pay for it. Alternatively, people can always keep their gold at home. A very high-risk option, as the chances that someone will have an adequate safe is small. Plus most insurance companies will probably not provide coverage in case the gold disappears. The truth is, without a good safe and insurance, there is a high risk that the investment will turn into a nightmare. Now we will look into if Bitcoin can be considered the new gold. It seems like the sky's the limit when it comes to Bitcoin. The cryptocurrency reached milestone after milestone in the last year and looks like it is finally leaving the fringes of the tech-savvy young public to conquer the financial market. Many young investors are starting to consider Bitcoin and other crypto coins as real alternatives to gold, the oldest safe haven investment in the world. But does it make sense to treat them as an alternative to good old gold? Let's take a look. It has been a hell of a ride for Bitcoin owners. After so many records and high-profile investments, it looks like cryptocurrency is finally breaking into the mainstream. In October 2020, a team of analysts at the JP Morgan Global Market Strategy Group touted Bitcoin as a gold alternative for millennials. It predicted that prices could double or triple if the trend continued. It was a Friday, October 23rd. That day, Bitcoin was being sold for $13,100. The JP Morgan analysts' prediction was a turning point. Only two years earlier the bank's CEO called Bitcoin a fraud and that he would fire anyone trading it for being stupid. Fast forward and here we are, hearing from the analysts of the legendary bank that investing in Bitcoin was not that stupid. Looking at the development of Bitcoin since then, even JP Morgan's analysts' prediction turned out to be conservative. Bitcoin would double in price in two months, triple in January 2021, and by February, after Elon Musk announced that Tesla invested $1.5 billion in Bitcoin and was planning to accept it as a form of payment, the cryptocurrency just skyrocketed. But the good momentum was not only a result of a JP Morgan change of heart or Musk's endorsement. Crypto is slowly being accepted as a legit investment. Besides Musk, other investors and CEOs are also betting on it. In 2020, Paul Tudor Jones, a well-known Wall Street hedge fund manager, said he invested almost 2% of his portfolio in Bitcoin. Larry Fink of BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager, said in December that Bitcoin could become a global market. MicroStrategy, an American software company, announced in December 2020 that it bought $650 million in Bitcoin, totaling more than $1 billion invested in the cryptocurrency. Square, a financial payment company led by Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey, announced in October that it was putting $50 million of its corporate cash into Bitcoin. PayPal also followed the trend and announced that it would allow people to buy and hold Bitcoin as well as a few other cryptocurrencies. There are endless examples of high-profile investors and companies pivoting in the Bitcoin direction. To complete the wave of good news, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, an American regulator, said in July 2020 that banks would be allowed to hold cryptocurrencies for customers. With so many milestones being achieved, some buyers are now treating the cryptocurrency somewhat like gold. Billionaire Mark Cuban, for example, although not an enthusiast, declared in December that Bitcoin is investable and a store of value like gold. Instead of trading in and out, investors are leaving their money on it. Similar to gold, Bitcoin became a way of keeping investments out of government's influence and the traditional financial market. But can we compare Bitcoin to gold? To answer this question, we need to understand both the differences and similarities between them. The biggest similarity is that both are finite resources. While gold is a mineral that is mined around the world, bitcoins, or any other cryptocurrency, are also produced by a process that is known as mining, but on the internet. Gold production totaled 3,531 tons in 2019, 1% less than the year before. And although there is no way to be sure, some estimates indicate that there is only about 20% of the total amount of gold in the world still to be mined. Meanwhile, as of February 8th, there are 18.6 million bitcoins with the numbers changing every 10 minutes when new blocks are mined. Each new block adds 6.25 coins into circulation. In total, only 21 million tokens will ever be created. This means that more than 88% of available bitcoin in the world has already been mined. And we are fast approaching the finish line. 
Another similarity resides in the fact that both gold and Bitcoin are assets that have little or no correlation with other stocks or currencies. Monetary policies, central banks or governments cannot directly control their value, even if indirectly their action can have an impact on it. What matters to define prices is supply and demand. On top of that, neither Bitcoin nor gold pay interest or dividends. But while they share these common characteristics, one big thing differentiates these investments, gold has an actual, physical value attached to it. Gold is valuable because of its historical, commercial and cultural use as well as its anti-corrosive and conductive properties. Bitcoin? Well, the enthusiasts might think this is not true, but scarcity in itself does not give a thing value. Bitcoin's value comes mainly from the expectation of the future and the belief that eventually its use will be accepted and widespread, therefore increasing its cost. Fact is, Bitcoin is still a speculative asset in a largely unregulated market. And using Bitcoin as cash is not yet a natural process. People do not have the confidence to undertake large transactions in Bitcoin. Crypto in general is still far too inefficient to be of much use for making payments. For example, Bitcoin is capable of processing fewer than 10 transactions per second. For every crisis or turbulence, investors know that traditional investments like government bonds will not bring the expected results and pivot to gold. They search for a real asset that cannot lose its value by the relentless supply of money. This is not yet the case with Bitcoin. Its price is much more volatile and has recently moved with the stock market, which is different from a supposed haven like gold. On top of that, the cryptocurrency trade is a market where fraud and theft are rampant. Crimes such as selling drugs online have been facilitated, and there were cases of even terrorists using crypto. People have used tokens to bypass laws and capital controls. Countries like North Korea, Venezuela, and Iran have also used the cryptocurrency to evade American sanctions. The Security Exchange Commission has sued blockchain payments company Ripple, accusing them of selling unregistered securities after the company sold the cryptocurrency XRP to investors. Owners of BitMEX, the world's largest cryptocurrency trading exchange, are facing criminal charges for allegedly using laundered money and allowing other illegal transactions. Janet Yellen, U.S. Secretary of Treasure, said that cryptocurrencies used for illicit purposes are a growing problem in the world. Some investors still aren't sure about what to do with the new phenomenon, as Mark Cuban summarized. A banana has more utility, potassium is a valuable nutrient to every person on the planet, but as long as people accept Bitcoin as a digital version of gold, it's investable. To invest in Bitcoin, one needs to believe in the value of it. To be honest, this is also true for other investments as well. But when it comes to stocks and bonds, for example, there are legitimate mathematical models to determine their value. Stocks produce earnings and bonds produce income. This is what determines their value. The same cannot be said about Bitcoin. It's still an unanswered question of how a modern asset like crypto will fit into legal structures dating back a century and how it can turn into a real safe haven. The progress witnessed in the last years makes it easy to believe that these financial structures will eventually adapt to the new model and crypto will be broadly accepted and easy to deal with and maybe even becoming a safe haven investment. However, there is no guarantee that will happen. Until then, comparing crypto and gold still seems like a matter of faith more than anything else. Now let's look into the Bitcoin founder mystery. On October 31, 2008, a user of a cryptography mailing list published this message online. The list was on a service hosted by Metsdown.com and run by Cypherpunks, an organized group of digital privacy activists. It was 2.10 p.m. on the east coast of the United States when members of the mailing received the message that contained the Bitcoin paper. Satoshi Nakamoto was the name of the author and the paper detailed a new peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system with no trusted third party. Three days later he mailed to the list again. And again two days later. On January 3, 2009, he released the first version of the Bitcoin software on its own domain. To register the Bitcoin.org he used Tor, an online track covering tool. Nakamoto himself mined the first 50 Bitcoins on the same day. Between 2009 and 2010, he wrote hundreds of posts on the forum, mainly talking with other users about how to improve the code of the software. He never shared any personal details. And then, in April 2011, he sent the last note saying he had to move on to other things. He never communicated with the members of the mailing list again. 
To this day, he has yet to be identified and his true name remains unknown. What Nakamoto created was not a new idea. The same cypherpunks that were part of the mailing list had been working on creating virtual cash since the 90s. Every effort had so far failed. But this time was going to be different. The main challenge of a digital currency was the so-called double spending problem. Translated into layman's terms, it means, if the currency is just online information, not physical like paper and metal coins, nothing prevents people from copying and pasting a code and spending as much as they want. The system Nakamoto created had a solution for that. And that was one of the reasons why it was such a game changer. Nakamoto's disappearance was followed by a lot of conspiracy theories. Before the launch of Bitcoin, there was no record of any coder with that name. By the time he went AWOL, he had an online profile that said he lived in Japan. But his email address was from a free German service. Meanwhile, Google searches for his name turned up no relevant information. For fans, he was quickly elevated to genius status, changing the world forever. There were t-shirts with his name, mangas and a base of loyalists. For the critics, his mysterious disappearance cast a veil of suspicion over what he created. Some even questioned if it was all a big pyramid scheme that rewards early adopters. Is Sakamoto now sitting at the top of all his early mind tokens and laughing at us all? Since his disappearance, his real identity has been an object of speculation and investigations. Article after article, book after book, all suspects fell one by one. Others believe that he disappeared due to safety concerns. An Argentinian researcher calculated that Nakamoto probably collected 1 million Bitcoin during the first year. This could explain his disappearance as it would make him a billionaire and a target. There are even websites calculating when Satoshi will become the richest person in the world. If he exists and is just one person, of course. Conspiracies aside, some facts surround the mystic figure. The Bitcoin system is so complex that some believe it could not have been developed by only one person, making it probable that it was a group of people. A coder has compiled all Nakamoto's messages on the mailing group and found that he always wrote between 5 a.m. and 11 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time. This is the equivalent of midnight to 6 a.m. on the U.S. East Coast. Assuming that he sleeps on a normal pattern, it would make sense that he is or was in the United States. Other clues suggest that he was British. His forum posts and his comments always used spelling like optimize with S in color with OU. The media has extensively investigated who is behind the name. So far, unsuccessfully. Nathaniel Popper, New York Times journalist, investigated who was behind the name. Although not able to find the real Nakamoto, he collected evidence that points to an American of Hungarian descent named Nick Sabo. The man denied the information, but the investigation showed that he was involved in a previous cryptocurrency project called Bitgold. He was also active among the cypherpunks. In 2014, researchers of Aston University in England found uncanny similarities between his writings and the text of Nakamoto. Another suspect was Hal Finney, who died in 2014 and was the recipient of the first ever conducted transaction. Nakamoto was the sender. Finney was an expert in cryptography, an experienced programmer, and also part of the cypherpunks. After his death, his body was not buried or cremated. He was cryogenically frozen at a facility in Arizona in the hopes of someday being resuscitated. He also denied being Nakamoto in the past. One person came forward, publicly claiming to be Nakamoto. Craig Wright, an Australian computer scientist, invited the press to witness him using cryptographic keys that belonged to Nakamoto. He did not convince anyone that he was who he was claiming to be and later denied the whole story after an online article suggested he might face arrest for enabling terrorism if true. There are different theories about why Sakamoto disappeared. Safety concerns and risk of arrest aside, some believe that it was a matter of principle to make the point of a decentralized currency clear. For Bitcoin enthusiasts, publicly known or not, he is still the hero of our time. The man who created the revolutionary tool that will reshape countries, governments, and our lives. And although Nakamoto's ideas were groundbreaking, the original system developed by him doesn't exist anymore. The current version of Bitcoin was improved and changed many times by a group of publicly known tech developers with nothing to hide since his disappearance. The truth is, right now, finding his identity seems irrelevant and will have no impact on the cryptocurrency's future. Now let's look into how the world would be if the dollar was still pegged to gold. Every once in a while, the gold standard goes back into fashion. The world has moved on from currencies attached to the precious metal for 50 years, 
but discussions around the topic are more vivid than ever. To understand why going back to the gold standard is still appealing to some people we need to dive into what are the disadvantages and advantages of the system. The biggest argument pro-gold standard has to do with safety and stability. One can argue that gold retains a stable value to the currency, and this theoretically could reduce the risk of instability and economic crises. With a fixed asset backing the money's value, governments wouldn't be able to raise their debts without first buying more gold. For some people, especially those who worry about hyperinflation and do not trust governments or central banks, the gold standard is a great tool to legally curb government spending and the money supply into society. According to this thought, with the currency attached to limited physical assets like gold, the risks of debt spiraling out of control followed by inflationary periods are smaller and long-term stability safety and prosperity would follow. Supporters of the gold standard believe that the system does not allow the government to resort to expansionary measures as it seems fit. Or what critics usually say, simply print more money to finance new debt. And let's be honest, the US debt problem is getting bigger by the day. At the end of 2020, the US government debt held by the public was at more than $21 trillion, a little bit more than the whole GDP. As a comparison, that's much more than what the country owns in gold. The US gold reserves were valued at $11 trillion by the end of 2020. If we look at the historical graph of United States debt since 1966 we can clearly see a path. Look at it here. That's when the country left the gold standard. Now check what happened next. Some believe that if the United States continues down this path, the result will inevitably be a severe crisis in the years to come and the solution for that might rest on going back to the gold standard. But for some, things are not as simple as gold standard defenders believe. No one disagrees that the US fiscal situation is challenging. But having the currency tied to gold would change some of the most basic fundamentals of the current monetary policy. In the ongoing system, the Federal Reserve can respond to financial crises in many ways. Among many measures, it can lower interest rates during a recession, raise the rates during an inflationary period, or it can buy or sell government bonds and inject money into the economy when necessary. And this flexibility to act according to the situation was very important in the last decade. During the 2008 financial crash or 2020 COVID crisis, the Fed has resorted to expansionary measures. In both cases, if the currency were still pegged to gold, the Fed's actions would be limited and one can only imagine both the social and economic impacts that might have incurred. On the gold standard system, the focus of any monetary policy would be diverted away from ensuring economic stability to maintaining an exchange rate target. With gold being the most important aspect of the economy, the country's need to keep its reserves intact becomes the focal point of the central banks, more than providing an ideal business scenario, fighting unemployment, or raising productivity. Also, making exchange rate adjustments would be more difficult and the government would have to resort to alternatives like protectionist measures, higher tariffs, import quotas, or exchange control. The results of this could harm economies around the world and affect global trade. Another negative aspect of the gold standard that is not very often discussed would be environmental damage. Gold is a scarce mineral. Increased demand for gold would mean that mining activity would also increase, very often on indigenous lands around the world. The impacts of this could be devastating. Okay, back to the question of how the economy would look like when we still have the dollar pegged to gold. Three economists have a possible answer to this question. Through a quantitative method, they calculate how the US economy would have performed if the dollar was still pegged to the gold between 2000 and 2020. The results are not very good for the gold standard advocates. For example, the researchers found that the shocks on gold supply and demand would have a greater negative effect on the economy than any other shocks that have happened, such as an economic crisis. If the gold standard was still in place during this period, we would have an increase in economic volatilities and a deterioration of the household welfare. Basically, the speed at which gold is mined introduces a lot of randomness to monetary policy. The Fed would have to set interest rates to maintain a fixed dollar price of gold, rather than to target inflation as it is today. For example, in moments of crisis, people spend less and investors purchase more gold, a safe haven investment. In this case, the central bank would have to increase the interest rate to make other assets more attractive and control the price of the mineral. If the reverse happens and for some reason there is more gold in the world, the central bank would have to lower the interest rate. In the end, the monetary decision would not be rational or based on facts and estimations, but more a matter of faith, 
or a belief on what could happen to the gold situation in the world. In summary, an economy based on how much gold is mined around the world would be, let's say, probably more unstable. But is it even reasonable to consider a transition back to gold standard? Well, it depends who you ask. For some, it would be a big mess, but not impossible. For starters, the United States would not be able to go back to the gold standard alone. Due to trade and money supply, it would be very complicated for the US to do this alone. Otherwise, countries that own large chunks of US debt, like China, for example, could just ask for their dollars to be exchanged for gold. In theory, that would not be a problem, but, and that's a big but, if every debt holder does the same, the US probably won't have enough gold in its reserve to pay it all back. Yes, the numbers don't match. So, if it wants to go down this path, the US would have to pump its gold reserves. Or the gold price would have to be set so high and the dollar would be so devalued that inflation would follow and trade would possibly crash. That's the scenario that critics of the gold standard believe to happen if an attempt to go back would take place. But defenders do not agree with that. In the end, the gold standard is not as unusual as some people want to believe. It's just a fixed-valued system. According to the IMF, many countries around the world have their currencies somehow linked to an external standard, typically the euro or the dollar. For a country going back to the gold standard would be more of the same and not that crazy. And if these views were once restricted to the fringes, it really made it to the mainstream in the last years. The Republican Party called for a commission to investigate the viability of going back to the gold standard on the campaign platforms of 2012 and 2016. A bill to establish a commission to look into the feasibility of the gold standard was approved in the House of Representatives in 2015 and 2017, but never managed to get approved in the Senate. Alexander Mooney, a representative from West Virginia, even proposed the full-on return to the gold standard on a bill that never got co-sponsors and never happened. In 2020, when then-President Donald Trump appointed Judy Shelton, a longtime gold standard advocate, to a seat on the Federal Reserve's Board of Governors, everyone thought that Shelton would finally get to the front seat of monetary policymakers. The nomination got stuck in the Senate and never happened, but Shelton's ideas were put under the spotlight. In the past, she had called for a new Bretton Woods conference, referencing the 1944 meeting that established the post-war economic order. To understand exactly what a new Bretton Woods would mean today, we need to go back in time and look into the origins of the first one. The road to Bretton Woods was paved by policies and choices from way before the conference. In 1900, the Gold Standard Act made the policy official in the United States. The gold dollar was then declared the standard unit, and all forms of money issued by the government were to be maintained at parity with it. After the First World War, countries started experimenting leaving the gold standard and printing more money to save their economies. The United States kept the gold standard. After the crash of 29, investors started trading commodities and currencies looking for safer investments and the price of gold rose. A hoarding phenomenon spread in the United States, affecting the country's gold reserves. In 1933, U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt issued an executive order forbidding hoarding and the Gold Reserve Act was signed in 1934. With the forbidding, people were allowed to keep just the equivalent of $100 and everything else needed to be returned to the state. The Gold Reserve Act would lead to the creation of the reserves at Fort Knox in 1936, the legendary U.S. gold depository in Kentucky where 143 million ounces of gold are kept at the moment. Fast forward to the last year of the Second World War. Representatives of 44 countries gathered in July 1944 in Bretton Woods, a resort place in New Hampshire, to organize what would be the post-war monetary system. It was also in the same event that the ideas of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, initially focused only on reconstruction, were forged. The Americans arrived at Bretton Woods in a very strong position. With reserves of 20,000 metric tons of gold, roughly 60% of the world's total, they advocated for fixed conversion rates assured by a dollar tied to gold. The Brits, heavily in debt and broke after the war were hoping for flexible exchange rates to revive exports. But the Americans feared post-war inflation. In the end, the Americans had their way. After the agreement, the countries were to keep their currencies fixed, but adjustable to the dollar, which was pegged to gold at 35 an ounce. It was only by 1959, however, that the system started operating as agreed in Bretton Woods. 
Up to this point countries maintained fixed exchange rates in relation to the dollar by buying their currency in exchange markets when too low or increasing the supply of money when too high. During the 60s, a surplus of dollars caused by foreign aid, military spending due to the Vietnam War and foreign investment made it almost impossible for the United States to keep the value of the gold at 35. Presidents tried to control the gold price with actions like restrictions on foreign lending. This resulted in the nation's foreign trading position being damaged for the overvalued dollar. In 1971 then-President Richard Nixon announced that the United States would no longer buy gold to maintain the price at $35 and halted the convertibility, which meant that countries could no longer redeem dollars for gold. Two years later, the gold standard was scrapped altogether. The members of the European community tied their currencies together and jointly floated against the US dollar. This marked the end of the Bretton Woods Agreement. With Sheldon Farr from the Fed's Board of Governors, a second edition of Bretton Woods might not happen anytime soon, but the idea of going back to gold standard is still around and will not go away. And now let's look into the most expensive cities in the world. They are definitely beautiful places, but living there is rather pricey for your average earner. Can you imagine paying $9.45 for a loaf of bread? Or more than $2,000 on rent for a one-bedroom apartment? Well, that's the reality of many people that live in the world's most expensive cities. Let's take a look at which metropolises made the list in 2020. It's easy to imagine that a city full of movie stars and celebrities is not very affordable. While the movie elite in Los Angeles lives in multi-million dollar mansions in Beverly Hills and other prime areas, the ordinary citizen needs on average $2,233 to afford a one-bedroom apartment in other areas. Cities in California have become even less affordable in recent years. Housing costs have continued to skyrocket and the cities are suffering an unprecedented homelessness crisis. Among the reasons, specialists point out the price of land and labor in the state. Sharing the fifth spot of our top list with Los Angeles is Copenhagen. The Danish capital is not only famous for its high prices, but also for its quality of life. Denmark ranked number two on the 2020 World Happiness Report. The citizens of Copenhagen might live in one of the most expensive cities in the world, but they also enjoy the benefits of one of the most efficient welfare states. Workers pay around 55% in taxes and in return, enjoy free healthcare, education, and many social programs. Maybe high prices are not that important when the basics you need are guaranteed by the state. What do you think? Next on the list is Geneva. The second biggest city in Switzerland hosts the highest number of international organizations in the world, including a major United Nations office and the International Red Cross. The city has a very large expat community. People from all over the world work and live there. All of this contributes to the prices and ranks the city among the most expensive in the world. Sharing the same place on the list with Geneva is the Big Apple. New York is probably the leading financial center in the world and a city with a diverse array of businesses and industries. In 2020, a loaf of bread in the city cost on average $9.45. 113 billionaires reside there. That is a world record. According to the financial services company Go Banking Rates, a New Yorker needs an annual salary of $219,000 to be happy. That's a lot. Maybe that's why they are famous for being cranky? Number 3 on the list is Osaka. The Japanese city is actually number one when it comes to personal computer prices. In 2020, a computer cost on average $1,828, that's $114 more than in the second place city, Tehran. Osaka has suffered from the coronavirus pandemic. Consumer prices in the city stagnated and the Japanese government subsidized costs such as public transport in 2020. The city slipped four points on The Economist ranking last year. Maybe the Japanese city is becoming more affordable? Sharing the same spot on the list is Tel Aviv. The Israeli city, famous for its sunny promenade and nightlife, is also among the most expensive in the world. A night out for two people in a mid-range restaurant cost on average $92.26. But don't worry too much if you are planning to visit. You will always be able to find a cheap and delicious falafel stand around the corner. Singapore slipped one spot down the list in 2020, holding on to the second place. 
The city-state is famous for its exorbitant prices and has topped the list several times. But the 2020 corona pandemic hit the city very hard. Prices fell as foreign workers left in masses. It was the first year since 2003 that the overall population contracted. The result was a decline in demand as well as deflation. The setting of the Hollywood blockbuster Crazy Rich Asians became a little bit more affordable for the not-so-crazy rich. Topping the list there's a three-way tie, Paris, Zurich and Hong Kong. 2020 saw cities across America, Africa and Eastern Europe become more affordable, while Western European cities became more pricey, mainly because of the rise of European currencies against the dollar. The French capital is often associated with glamour, luxury, haute couture, and much more. Paris also became a talking point among series watchers in 2020, as Netflix debuted its hit show Emily in Paris. The show immediately became the subject of a lot of discussions. How was it possible that the main character could afford such a lavish lifestyle with an Eiffel Tower view from her apartment? The actor Lucas Bravo, who plays Emily's love interest in the series, said the show portrays a very narrow slice of Parisian life. Touché. With the city getting more expensive every year, he's got a point. Very few would be able to move there and afford a life like Emily's with lots of eating out, bars, parties, and expensive clothes. Well, the over 49,000 Parisians with a net worth of over 5 million US dollars certainly can. The other European city topping the list is Zurich. The banking center is known for its crazy prices and high standard of living. For example, having a meal in a mid-range restaurant, a couple will spend no less than $125 on average. Research shows that 7.5% of the Swiss population are millionaires. Most reside in Zurich. The presence of so many millionaires plays a big role on the high prices of the Swiss city. Last but not least, sharing the top spot is Hong Kong. Famous for its population density, the former British colony has a huge real estate problem. In fact, it is considered the world's least affordable housing market. And although the rise in real estate prices has slowed down somewhat in recent years, it is still a lot higher than in the rest of the world due to the skyrocketing growth of the last decades. The situation is so crazy that a parking spot was once sold for a staggering $664,000. Yep, just a parking spot, not the apartment. Hong Kong is well known for being Asia's biggest financial center. It attracts businesses from all over the world and many international companies have a presence there. That fact, of course, attracts well-paid people, usually expats. This obviously also plays a role in pushing prices up. That's it for this video. Since you made it to the end, stick around, click into our other videos and keep watching. We hope you liked our video and subscribe to our channel.